Honestly, I promise I'll stop with the history, but how did the Romans affect what was happening in Israel at the time of the death of Jesus? That's what we'll talk about today. I'm utterly struck on how, 300 years after his execution, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Peter Jennings. Okay, I admit it. I think about the Roman Empire all the time, too. It's not just guys. But the reason we're going through all this history is I'm trying to set the stage, like I said, of all these people who Jesus talked about, all these people who talked about Jesus, and how we came to the execution of Jesus and these competing interests. And so this is the last of the series. I know for some of you who don't like history, this has been a long slog through history, but I hope you found it interesting in how these different groups all came together and put Jesus to death, and they all had their own reasons. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Part of this conversation is through some of the research that I had been doing previously, but some of it also has to do with a book called The Last Week, A Day-to-Day Account of Jesus' Final Week in Jerusalem by Marcus J. Borg and John Dominic Prosan. Now, I want to say at the offset, I disagree with the main point of this book. How they're looking at the last week of Jesus and the whole mission of Jesus is, one, it is less about internal striving for doing God's will as much as it's being involved in political change, the care and concern of the poor, and almost more like our political, I don't want to say political in the sense of voting, but what we do on earth for other people. And they wrote the book because they saw Mel Gibson's book on the passion of the Christ and felt like there were just things that weren't correct about it or attitudes that weren't correct about it. And so this book is really there to confront it. I don't necessarily agree with this book on the points that I believe Jesus was here as Messiah. His final week here was to fulfill our salvation. And he did call on us to not only change our internal being more towards God, but also our external being towards God. So there's things that I don't necessarily disagree with, that if you take the whole story and all the missions working up to Jerusalem, you get a different picture of what Jesus is here on earth to do. But this is their book. But the point of this is that they talk about Jerusalem and the Romans there. And so this framework of what we're going to talk about today has to do with the parts that are not controversial. This is the Roman Empire in Jerusalem that led up to the death of Jesus. So first of all, my research of the Romans is is not controversial, is they wanted to be in charge of the whole world. They believed in crushing power. They believed in occupying lands, and they occupied everybody's lands, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks. They were sacking nation after nation and moving onwards and outwards. And then what they would do is install friendly governments, put in local administrators, leave a contingency of military there to make sure the peace was maintained. And so their whole idea of these lands is don't get anyone upset, don't get revolts, don't get rioting, just keep everyone in place, collect taxes, keep it orderly, make sure the basics are there like water and basic needs for people. So there's no revolt. They were very much into that. They didn't want any form of dissent or rioting at all. But that also means that they wanted peace. And so there was always that discussion of Augustus Caesar and his Pax Romana, you know, the peace of Rome, because partially they thought the, themselves to be very civilized and very advanced culture. They took the Greek philosophy on and put muscle behind it. And so they were going to bring peace to everywhere, but partially it's self-serving too. Not so much that they wanted peace, although they maybe did. I can't read Roman's mind, but because they also wanted places not to riot and not to break away from them. And so the only way they could conquer the world is if everyone just cooled their jets and did not revolt against them. So they kept progressing through North Africa, all the way to the British Isles. And they also built amazing roads. But the Roman influence in Israel was also stunning. They found partners in the Sadducees. They found partners in Herod to keep things going without a lot of 
intervention and without a lot of troops on the ground, right? Again, if I'm going to take over the whole world, I have to leave a small contingency there. Of course, they all recruited people from the ranks of the various nations they sacked. But if you have to keep large armies everywhere, you're never going to get all the places you want to go. And so then these officials that were put into the government were there to collect taxes. And you could tell the people hated the taxes. That's why there was so much rumbling in there. The taxes were high. Herod also put a tax on top of people. He was rebuilding the temple and making it big and making it beautiful. And that takes manpower. And as we know nowadays, whenever you have to hire people, you have to pay them a lot. And so it cost money. And so half of these taxes that were getting put on people were so burdensome, they would have to give up their only livestock. They would have to give up land. They would have to give up children. I mean, it was hardship on people. And the Sadducees, who were the aristocrats in the area, didn't have much sympathy. In fact, they got rich off of it. Because if you couldn't pay your taxes, well, maybe I'll buy your land from you. And some of these people were part of the rabbis, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, who were part of the Levi class. And if you listen to the past episode, people in the Levi class were not allowed to own land. They were supposed to be supported by the other 11 tribes. But now you could see through some kinds of tricks of scripture mangling, they saw what they were doing of stealing people's lands as beneficial. We're helping people out. And so we're not getting rich off of the backs of taxes. We're just helping people who desperately need money at a time. And so a lot of these people who were part of the priestly class were suddenly landowners farm owners and doing all these other activities that in the past they weren't really allowed to do. So then we also see that there were publicans and publicans were public officials. These were the people who were supposed to collect the taxes, run the government, make sure the water was there. And some of them were humble. Zacchaeus is someone we're going to find in Luke, was named as someone who was a publican. Some of them were tax collectors like Matthew. So we'll see other people who were hired as Roman officials who were Jewish in the area. And a lot of what we know about the Roman people in this time comes from Josephus, who was an Assyrian Jew with a Greek name, and he wrote a lot about the histories of the Romans, and he'll talk about what happens next. The fact that the temple will be torn down and the people of Jerusalem in particular will be enslaved, taken captive thrown out of the city, and the city destroyed. And that will be end of Jerusalem for a long time. And Tacitus, from 56 to 117 AD, was a Roman historian. He was well known. He did not like Christians and Jews, and wrote that Nero blamed the great fire of Rome in 64 AD on Christian followers. Not true, but he said that it was related to a mischievous superstition, which a lot of people believe is a reference to Jesus. Pliny the Younger, from 61 AD to 113 AD-ish, he was a Roman magistrate. And so he documented that early Christians believed Jesus was God and had a strict moral code and regularly worshiped. They sang songs, they shared meals, they helped the poor, they took in children who had no home and noted that. And then there was also Lucian of Samosota, 115 AD to 200 AD, and he mocked Christians for following a crucified guy. And he documented the beliefs of the people at this time. And there were other types of Romans account that Jesus had a brother named James, that the Jews, that the appeal of Jesus was not just a Jewish thing or a Greek thing, but started spreading out throughout the entire Roman nation. In fact, later on, and we're not talking about it in this podcast, One of the barbarians that took down the Roman Empire was a Christian. So he became a Christian outside of the Roman Empire and then struck it militarily. They recorded that the Jewish leaders did not like Jesus and had a low opinion of him, that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate, a prefect of Judea, 26 AD to 36 AD, and Jesus was called Christos, which is a term for Messiah. So just a little bit of background about it. But now when we talk about the book, the last week, and this is their research and their uh, endeavors, 
And they tell it through the Gospel of Mark because Mark is a clash of kingdoms. And we'll get into it in the Bible in small steps, the differences between Matthew, which is about clashes of faith and how to live and the lessons of that. Mark is a different kind of chapter. Each of the apostles had different views. And so we'll talk about that later. But what will happen is their belief is that Mark is telling the story as a reflection of what happens in 70 AD. And in 70 AD, there is a revolt. In 70 AD, the Romans decimate Jerusalem, slaughter the people there. I forgot how many they said were killed and exile the rest. And that was the end of Jerusalem being Israel's capital for a long time. And so, of course, our first day is Palm Sunday. As Jesus comes in, he is staying in a place called Bethphage and Bethany, which is near the Mount of Olives. It is on the other side. So Jerusalem sits on a hill, a mountain. There is a deep valley that goes between it. We talked about how this valley got filled with tombstones to prevent the Messiah from coming. But on the other side is an olive tree grove. And this is called Mount of Olives. I was accidentally referring to it as the Olive Garden, but it is. It's an olive garden. And he spent his time over there in Bethany. It's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. But one of the things that you know about it when you're on Mount of Olives, it's like two mountains sitting across a valley from each other. It is on the side of the temple. So he could see when he was sitting on Mount Olive, the places where the devil took him to tempt him and told him, throw yourself off of here and the angels will save you. He was able to see the activity, the bustling. If this was Passover time, people were coming to Jerusalem as part of their faith. They were supposed to come and bring sacrifices, bring their taxes and celebrate Passover together. So he tells people to go out and get a colt and a donkey and bring them to him. And so he, they do that. They bring him the donkey. People lay down the branches and say, Hosanna, which means save us. It's like a scream, right? It's desperate for saving. And he enters Jerusalem. As we go in, he's going in through one gate. That was one point that they wanted to make clear. Where he came in, lowly on a donkey, not on a horse. The Romans would have ridden majestic horses and had an arsenal of people following them, soldiers, comes in on a donkey and not in the gate that the Romans would have come in and the imperial guards would have come in. He came in the gate where people come in. And so Pilate, when he comes into the city, he would have come in through a different area because he had his own entry. They wanted, again, to be majestic. They wanted to appear, we are in charge here. Don't mess with us. But Pilate, for the most part, uh, stayed in what was Herod's area inside of Jerusalem. But for the most part, he stayed in Caesarea, which is on the coast. It's about 60 miles to the west. Beautiful place. Herod also built that too. But it was a trading place where Rome could bring and take supplies back and forth. And primarily, Pilate stayed over there. But when he was in the old city, he would stay in Herod's old grounds and rule and try to, you know, like I said, keep the peace and make sure no one gets out of whack here. You know, we want to keep everything down. So he said that this whole thing of Pilate entering in through his majestic gate with his armies and his horses, and then Jesus coming in on a donkey with the people laying down branches in honor of Jesus, gives, he says, this confrontation between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God and the life of Jesus and the life of the Roman Pilate. And so that's where his story takes place. And he said that at a time, J Jerusalem was not just any sort of city. First of all, it's a very old city. It also, when you read, and we will read in the Bible in small steps someday about what happened back in that time, but eventually Jerusalem became the point where it was what they call a domination system, economic, what they call economic exploitation, political oppression, and a religious crackdown. And so Jerusalem, while amazing and while the center of Jewish faith, got a reputation of basically cracking down on the people who were living outside of Jerusalem. And so you'll see when we talk in the Bible in small steps about Matthew, how Jesus is spending all his time up in Galilee. It is outside kind of the jurisdiction of Herod's children. It is not in the city. You think, 
well, if Jesus is here and he's going to preach his ministry, why doesn't he go to the main action? Why, you know, like Jesus came today. Why would he go to the middle of nowhere, Montana, when he could go to New York City and have everyone see him? Well, we know the reason why, because he would get cracked down on. And he was waiting, building up his ministry where he can, he's going to come into Jerusalem for the last time. So Pilate, when he was living in Rome, he was living in Herod's pools, ceilings, it says, they're, they're marble. And it was like the temple it was beautiful. It could hold 300 guests. And so this was new, Pilate's new digs inside of Jerusalem. But as we know from the Dead Sea Scroll, there were a lot of places out in the hinterlands that were plotting the end of the Romans. And that was a problem, I think, for many believers in Jesus, too, because they were looking for someone to overthrow the Romans. They weren't looking for someone to save their souls. They were looking for someone to crush and get these foreigners out. But instead, John was talking about repenting and sins. And then Jesus comes along and he talks about the kingdom of God. And when the Pharisees and the Sadducees try to trick him into tax collection questions, thinking, aha, now we're going to find out. Either he's going to be a Roman suck up like all of us, or he's going to go against the taxes and be on the side of the people. But now the Romans will hate him. He didn't do either of those things. And so he skirted this whole political tinder bed between Caiaphas and the Roman Empire very carefully. He did not get himself involved in politics. And that's why I kind of differ from this book is this is not Jesus telling you the end of the temple is coming, you know, you are going to be cast out. Don't fight about your taxes. This is about the kingdom of God. So in their view, Mark was written somewhere, not any earlier, they say, than 65. Five years later, the temple gets destroyed, and that's the end of it. So he said that this means that Mark probably saw all this coming, and their contentions in this book, well, is that the kingdom of God is political as well as spiritual, religiously the kingdom of God, politically the kingdom of God, both brought together. And again, the Essenes, we talked about this before, believed that there was going to be a political Messiah and a religious Messiah. And they're saying Jesus was both of those things, which I think we think that Jesus is both of those things. I think that they think more of the politics was important in Jesus' ministry than maybe I think what it was about. And so they point out that most of Jesus' ministry was not inside of a city, the only city in Mark, but he did go to other cities because it's mentioned in other Gospels, was the Galilee area, but he only went to Jerusalem. And instead, he spoke to the countryside and the wilderness and smaller towns around Galilee. So his message were to people outside of the city and away from the Roman and the temple leadership. And they go a bit into about sacrifices, and we'll talk about that in the future, because now we're going to switch away from the history and talk more about Jesus last week and the ministry, not just with this book, because like I said, I think that this book has an angle I don't agree with necessarily, but I do believe that their investigation of what the last week is about is top notch. So we'll talk a little bit about it and why they have the opinions that they do. So my challenge to you is think about the countryside versus the city and the different attitudes we see even today between the two. If Jesus were coming back, would he go to a city? Obviously, Jesus is coming back. We're all going to see him in the clouds and it's going to be very obvious. But I just mean that if we were in equal times, would Jesus still go and minister to the countryside? Would he go to the cities? And why is that? What are the differences between the two? And Think about, too, that stark image of Pontius Pilate and his Roman legions and the horses in the majestic gate and Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday, riding on a donkey with people laying down boughs and worshiping him and asking Jesus to save them. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. And remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Please tell a friend and let someone know about this podcast. My goal eventually is that we'll have a community where we can talk about some of these issues and discuss some issues of faith. If you didn't know, A Better Life in Small Steps is now my network site that I'm working on with my friend. 
We are going to be blogging from this website, but it is also a place where you can see where all the other podcasts are and get other information. We're still building the website, but it is up and running and you can take a look at it. And this eventually will be the home of whatever it is the Small Steps Empire becomes. And we think about that sorrowful ride of Jesus going from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem for that last time. Thank you very much. Thank you.